Hey everyone, welcome to Group Text. My guest today is Marie Margolis, who is the director of the gripping new documentary, Allende, which premieres August 27th on MSNBC at 10 p.m. and is available the following day on Peacock. Allende tells the story of how members of the Afghan national women's football team, that is soccer to us, orchestrated and executed a daring escape from their home country of Afghanistan after Kabul fell to the Taliban during the summer of 2021. The film made its debut this year at the Tribeca Film Festival and has been submitted for consideration in the short documentary category for the 96th Academy Awards. Here to talk about her new movie is Marie herself. Welcome to Groove Text. Hi, Melissa. Thanks for having me. Okay, so this documentary is harrowing. So can you give the listeners a brief primer on the crisis, how it's affected the team, the Taliban resurgence, and sort of where things stand now without giving away the story? Yeah, yeah. So so almost two years ago exactly, summer of 2021, the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan after 20 years of occupation. And in the wake of that withdrawal, um, the Taliban pretty swiftly regained control of the country. And when that happened, you know, um, all sorts of people, different types of people were in danger under the Taliban regime, Um, particularly girls and women, uh, particularly girls and women who had, you know, made a life being functioning members of society. So um, doctors, lawyers, women with careers, uh, girls who were going to school, um, and certainly girls who were playing sports, um, which is, in the Taliban's eyes, completely forbidden. And so the film is about a group of young soccer players who um, couldn't imagine living in a world where they couldn't play the sport they loved, uh, they couldn't go to school, and where they were effectively going to be erased from society. And so they escaped. Um, And they did that with the help of a group of sort of vigilante style uh, international operatives, some of whom work for the government of the U.S., some of whom don't. Uh, one of whom is a 24-year-old Afghan-Canadian soccer player. Um, and they got out uh, and made their way to Portugal, where they now have asylum and um, are rebuilding their lives. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper, obviously, into all of this. But the title of the film struck me. Ayanda, what does that mean? Yeah, so Ayenda is the Farsi word for future. Um, It is the girls' um, kind of self-appointed name, team name. Um, Obviously, the Afghan Football Federation doesn't really exist anymore, certainly not for these girls. Um, But they are still very much and still very much see themselves as a team. Um, And so uh, Ayenda is their team name. What introduced you to the story? So in the summer of 2021, as the withdrawal was happening, there was all sorts of news coverage um, about the groups of people who were trying to escape. And I honestly had a really hard time wrapping my head around the idea that women who were playing sports um, were in danger because of that. Um, I grew up and always have played soccer. And at Harvard. So so this really hit home for you because you're a former Harvard female soccer player. So yeah. and a journalist. So this really did you did you hear about it through the soccer community? So yes, sort of. Um I heard about it. So so there was all sorts of coverage about groups of people who were trying to escape um, a lot of female athletes. And so um, I reached out to, I actually reached out to Julie Foudy, who is a um, legend of the U S women's national team and was the captain for a while. And 
uh, is now a journalist at ESPN and, and sort of asked her like, what is going on with the Afghanistan football federation? You know, there was talk of the national team getting out the, the senior national team getting out um, and going to Australia. And Julie was like, I really don't know, but here's a lobbyist friend who I know who is kind of in the middle of it all. I talked to her lobbyist friend, her lobbyist friend introduced me to some other guy who worked at a, you know, airline who was helping and he introduced me to someone else. And 10 phone calls later, I got myself in touch with one of the folks who was sort of at the center of the operation to get the girls out. Um, and so he caught me up on kind of their effort to get the girls out. They were probably two weeks in at that point. And he said, you know, it's too dangerous to give you a lot of information at the moment. Um, but once the girls are safe, I'll give you a call. And so he calls me two or three weeks later and says, great news. The girls are leaving Afghanistan. They're on their way to Portugal and they're going to be there in two days. Um, and so if you want to meet them, if you want to learn more about the story, you can come. And so I got on a flight uh, with a camera operator and met the girls in Portugal when they landed and started filming Ayanda. Because I say the making of this, how much of it was real time coverage and, and that you, how were you able to get that? Especially coming in and having sort of to recreate the whole thing with, I'm assuming, footage that they had taken of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was really a discovery process on the ground from the second I got to Portugal. Um, what the girls had just been through was traumatizing, um, complicated, uh, certainly not my area of expertise, the, the Afghan United States um, relations. And so I had a lot of learning to do in that first couple months filming with the girls. Um, but the escape had already happened. So right. I was sort of filming and learning as I went. Um, but really, most importantly, getting to know the girls and um, developing trust and relationships with them that were strong enough um, that they then shared cell phone footage and voice memos and images with me um, after the fact and kind of talked me through, hey, this is a video of us waiting at the gas station when the Taliban showed up. And this is a photo of us, you know, um, walking to the airport after 20 days of waiting. Like they, uh, I think for a lot of them, it was just sort of instinct to capture this incredible journey. Um, and as you said, harrowing journey that they were going through in real time. And then I was just lucky enough that they trusted me enough to share all of that with with me. It, it's pretty crazy when you actually sort of step back and realize if they had been caught or if this had not gone as planned, they weren't going to get a fine or put in jail. They would have been killed. How is How did you separate yourself as the filmmaker and journalist from not just wanting to break that that wall. And you said earning the trust, but not just want to put your arms around them and say, you know, you'll never be like this again and have that sort of protective instinct come out. Because you do have to keep a distance to ac accurately tell the story. I think that was one of the most challenging parts of this process was it was super important to me that all of the girls and their families who were involved in this film knew exactly what I was doing. So on the very first day I started filming um, with Farkunda, the, the um, kind of main character's help, I explained to all of them what I wanted to do, the story I wanted to tell, um, and gave them the opportunity to basically raise their hand and say, I want to be in this, I want to be a part of it, or I don't. Um, they were all enthusiastic um, and excited about the opportunity to tell their story. Um, but that was the beginning of, like I said, real relationships with these people. That was the only way I was going to be able to tell their story um, accurately, accurately, um, and kind of with the the care that it deserved. Um, 
But then the problem was I really cared about them and, and still do. Um, and so I think I had to toe a line constantly between um, learning and gathering information um, and not crossing a line that might color how I told the story. Um, and it's hard, you know, it's not a science. It's, it's um, every moment I felt like there were decisions I had to make in the field of how do I act? How do I conduct myself as a filmmaker, but also a human in this moment? Um, and, you know, I, I did my best and that's all I could really do. There had to be moments where you just went back to your hotel and cried and called your family. You know, it, it, that's, that's a, it's very hard when you're trying to work. It's really hard. I think it's, there's a really difficult reality about documentary filmmaking that the endeavor is inherently exploitative. Every documentary, every story that we tell, regardless of the subject matter, we are using someone else's story um, to make to make art. And hopefully that art is made, like I said, with care and quality. Um, but it's hard to, especially when it's young girls um, who are in a new place, in a new culture with a language they don't speak, um, to make sure that I, you know, I was super cognizant of always making sure that I felt good about the way um, I was capturing their story and the way I was um, telling it to the world. So the movie opens like a Mission Impossible operation, this voice giving these teenage girls very serious instructions. Uh, whose voice were they hearing? Yeah, they're hearing the voice of Farkunda Mutaj who is, um, like I said, the 24-year-old Afghan-Canadian soccer player who sort of by happenstance and her own um, initiative to try and help Afghanistan in the wake of this um, tragedy, um, she became sort of the, the heartbeat of the operation to get the girls out. She was first and foremost the translator um, so she was relaying information from the operations team to the girls. So the operations team was, you know, a bunch of mostly former um, uh, governmental folks, veterans, people who had real connections on the ground in Afghanistan and had the knowledge and the infrastructure to move a large group of, of people out of Afghanistan um, during the crisis. Um, and she was really the conduit between that group of operatives and this group of 16, 17, 18 year old girls. Um, so she became, you know, not only their voice of, and sort of this disembodied voice telling them what to do at every turn, um, but also in a lot of ways, their emotional support and, um, their source of hope. And, you know, Farkunda tells stories about in the darkest of moments with the girls when they were really um, dejected and not feeling super optimistic about their chances of getting out. You know, she would do things. And, is it, and I'm sure terrified. Terrified, completely terrified, um, wondering if it's worth it. Uh, Farkunda would do things like you know, yoga and breathing exercises and have them imagine their lives as professional soccer players abroad and really amazing um, kind of like psychological support um, all over voice memos on WhatsApp. Insane. Um, I mean, these girls faced an unimaginable decision. Um, they had to choose some family members to take with them to safety, knowing that they were leaving others behind to face the wrath of the Taliban. I mean, how how did they do that? And, I mean, knowing you're never going to see these people again, how did they... Um, I, I couldn't emotionally cope with that now, 
but you hear about these stories and you hear about it even going back like into the Holocaust where people had to make these decisions. How did they do it? It is one of the um, hardest things that these girls had to do. Um, a lot of them come from larger families. And the reality is that it's hard to move one person out of um, a country in crisis, let alone 10 or 20 or 30. Um, this was a group, this was a team of about 20 players. And so each of them were only allowed to bring three family members with them for logistical reasons. Um, and every family kind of went about that a different way. Um, some of the girls didn't really have a choice. You know, they were told, here's who's going with you. Um, I think some of the choice was made out of necessity. The Taliban requires women to be accompanied by a male family member when they leave the house. And so knowing that getting stopped by the Taliban was a real possibility, I think a lot of these girls just had to bring their fathers or brothers with them. Um, but I mean, families are complicated and there were, I think they had lots of conversations um, and I think every family kind of tried to decide what was best in a situation that was uh, absolutely kind of unthinkable. Um, and so it was really a case by case basis, but it, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It was one of the, the hardest things they had to do. I mean, it is as a parent, I couldn't imagine my son having to make that kind of a decision and help him through making it, removing yourself from the situation and really thinking what is best for them. Like you said, they had to be, there had to be a male and you might be leaving your mother and your sisters behind. Um, were they concerned that there would be, um, retaliation against their family members left behind? You know, um, that was something that, like I said, I was super cognizant of from the very beginning. Um, the girls that are featured in the film um, were some that were, you know, absolutely comfortable with their story being told in this format. Um, I think in general, there's concern for retaliation. Um, anyone who was at all um, kind of aligned with the US backed government um, is at risk. Any women who held jobs, who go to school, um, I think the treatment, you know, the Taliban did a really good job at the beginning uh, being on their best behavior and kind of showing the world that it was a different Taliban than the one that we've known before. And as time goes on, the reality is that that's not the case. And that's super clear. Um, and so, yeah, I think the girls are absolutely afraid of um, not even necessarily retaliation, but just the general treatment of the people of Afghanistan under this regime is pretty terrifying. So the initial plan to get the girls out doesn't work. Then another plan doesn't work. And then another plan doesn't work. How you have they, they had to believe that all hope was lost. Um, how did they not give up hope? How did they keep, you know, believing that this could happen? I mean, there had to be doubt. And they're young. I mean, we're, we're all getting these are teenage girls. Yeah. Yeah. I I think this is where the, the soccer aspect of their identity really comes into play. Um, in order to play soccer at all in Afghanistan, even under the previous government, these girls had to have an incredible amount of determination um, and bravery to do that on a daily basis. Um, and I think that's a testament to how much they love the game and how much they value individuality and joy and self-expression and all the things that I think we all value um, and how much they were willing to fight for it. So that was no different when they were trying to leave Afghanistan. Um, Sadaf, who's, who's one of the main voices in the film on the team, 
told me the story that um, didn't quite make it into the film, but there's sort of a reference to it um, where she says, you know, after the third failed attempt, her dad said to her, Sadaf, like, we cannot do this. We've tried. We're out of money. You know, we're hungry. We need water. We need to go home. Um, and this isn't going to happen. So kind of let's just drop it and go home. And Sadaf says to him, essentially, you can do that if you want. Um, you can go home. That's cool. But I would rather die than stay in Afghanistan. So I'm going to keep trying. Um, and me and my teammates are going to keep trying. And she was just steadfast in her determination to get out. Um, you know, I think so many of the things that make these girls who they are, are the very same, the, the, the same things that the Taliban was going to take away. And so she, you know, their life was on the line either way, you know, like they, if they stayed in Afghanistan, their life as they knew it was over. Um, if they were injured or killed on their way out of Afghanistan, their life was over. Um, and I think that's really how they viewed it. Like it, it was life or death. Which is interesting because in when the plane is leaving and lifting off for Portugal, a lot of them say they would like to return to Afghanistan one day. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. The level of pride and love, like deep, deep love for the place that they came from is one of the things that actually struck me the most as I got to know the girls. Um, they really, and I think this is something that as Americans, you know, we think of Afghanistan as this war-torn country that has all sorts of problems. And, and I think you can see in the film, like for these girls, it was their home and it was filled with love and it's, a you know, aesthetically and geographically it's a beautiful place um and the culture is so meaningful to them and so they didn't want to leave like they didn't have a choice um and so i think that's one of the things that you know i talked to i talked to sadaf the other day on the anniversary of of the taliban taking over and i asked her how she's feeling and how she's doing and she said, you know, I'm happy. I feel grateful. I'm safe. She's playing soccer on a really great club team and in Portugal. Um, but she's like, I want to go back. And so I'm, you know, basically preparing and living my life here in Portugal in order to go back to Afghanistan someday. How are they supporting themselves? Yeah, so there was, the Portuguese government was great and they, provided a lot of aid and support um, for the first like 18 months or so that the girls and their families were there um, in the form of housing and stipends and things like that. Um, that aid program is, you know, I don't know the details of it, but I assume it's up if not soon to be. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the girls have found jobs themselves um, their parents have tried to find jobs. Again, the government's been been helpful um, and humanitarian groups that they've been paired up with have been helpful, but it's super challenging. I mean, especially for the parents who most of them don't speak English. The girls are probably better suited to make a living in Portugal than their parents are in a lot of ways. Um, so it's challenging to say the very least. I can't do it justice, but the scene when they finally meet Arkunda is simply amazing. Um, how well, What did the women say they felt like when they finally actually got to put a face and a voice together? Mm -hmm. Was Had they imagined her correctly? It's funny. They, the girls, it's funny about it. They, um, they describe it as they had started to think that Farkunda maybe like wasn't real. Like she was again for so long, she was this like disembodied voice. voice. Um, and so they were totally taken by surprise. I mean, they love and adore her to a degree that is hard to describe. 
Um, but I think it was really surreal for them to see her in the flesh. Um, they had no idea she was coming. That was actually one of my first shoots in Portugal. So I'm following Farcunda with a camera. She's like, this will be awesome. Trust me. I'm like, I am just trusting this person. I don't know much about the story yet. And it turned out to be one of the most touching and profound um, reunions that I've ever seen. And the best is that she tells them to go to bed that they had practiced the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so your background is in journalism and you played soccer while you were there at Harvard. Did you get a chance to play at all with the girls in Harvard, uh, with the girls in Portugal? Did you bring your cleats? I never brought my cleats, but I did my very last day. The last time I was in Portugal was about a year, a few months ago, last spring. Um, and I played with Sadaf and her sister. Um, and I think, I don't know that they, you know, I think they were surprised that I, uh, I had had some, uh, some skills. So it was fun. And um, it was, it was hard to be filming them and not jump out on the field with them. Like, I love the game so much. Um, and that's so much of why I was drawn to the story. Um, so being around it and the joy that it brought them was part of the fun of making this. What do you hope people take away? Oh, I hope um, that people remember um, what's happening in Afghanistan and that there are real humans um, with lives and hopes and dreams that are being affected in real ways. Um, I think often when something like the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and the subsequent Taliban takeover happens, the news cycle is all over it for a little bit of time. And then something else happens and everybody moves on. And that's the way of life. And um, I get it. But I think watching this film, hopefully people will remember that for a, you know, millions of people, um, this didn't go away and it's still happening um, and that, you know, something needs to be done. The Taliban is, um, is like I said, getting more and more restrictive and the lives of everyone there are um, really in danger on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, reminding people of that is um, something I hope they'll, they'll walk away with. You know, and I, one of the reasons I love it is, you know, they always say that art brings people together. I am a firm believer that sports is another one of those sort of great unifying things that gets rid of all boundaries and prejudices. And I'm a firm believer in that. Um, so I, I love that angle. What is next for you? What, what do, let's get a shallow. What you working on now? Yeah, unsurprisingly, more soccer. Um, so I'm working on a series about the U.S. women's national team um, and their journey leading up to and during the World Cup. Um, so I just got back from Australia filming with some of the players there um, and in deep in the edit for that now, which is fun. I, before I let you go, I have to ask, what are your thoughts on what happened? I think they're a young team. I think they're young. I know they're number one in the world, but nerves, nerves. It happens and you peak too early or too much pressure, you know? I think that's certainly a big part of it. I think it's a confluence of factors, some of which are have nothing to do with the team itself. It has to do with the world, the rest of the world getting better um, and sort of getting hip to women playing soccer. What a novel idea. Um, and federations putting resources and money into the development of their programs. And so the competition is tougher and that's a really good thing. Um, so I think that's a silver lining for sure. Um, and yeah, this is a team in transition. Um, they had a lot of injuries for key people, uh, a lot of young players in their first world championship. Um, there's a whole host of host of reasons um, that we'll explore in uh in the Netflix doc that I'm working on. There you go. Everyone needs to watch a, a everyone needs to watch Ayanda 
on August 27th on MSNBC. It premieres at 10 p.m. And if you don't catch it then, definitely pick it up on Peacock the following day. Maria, I want to have you back because I want to have a whole sports discussion with you. Oh, love it. I do, too. I do, too. I got to start prepping for my fantasy football team. Um, oh, likewise. <laughs> thank you so much.